Welcome to this conversation on Business Redefined. This is your weekly most comprehensive look at the world of business, finance, and economics. Tonight, we want to talk about the subject of subsidies and the cost of living, specifically matters regarding the fuel subsidies. Six days ago, the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority undertook what was deemed to be a shock slash in the subsidy. If you do the math, it translates to about 15 billion shillings down compared to the month before. And we want to delve deep into this conversation in terms of what this means when it comes to a ripple effect across the economy. And we're delighted to have Martin Chomba on set from the Petroleum Dealers Association. Welcome on set. We have Churchill Ogut, who is an economist with IC Group, Karibu Sana. Thank you. And joining us from Mombasa, we shall be having the economist from the University of Nairobi, that's XN Iraqi, who shall also be sharing his insights into this subject matter. But for now, let's begin here in studio. And uh, let me start with Martin. Um, many Kenyans were really aggrieved by the slash in the fuel subsidy. I'd imagine you're one of the few who are actually celebrating. Yes. Well, um, I know uh, the way our economics is um, uh, outlay is, is that uh, people felt uh, disappointed that uh, the government has done away with the subsidy. But what in, in essence happened is that, and what most people did not know, is that this subsidy was not anchored on a model that is sustainable for the people within the value chain of the business. Um, what subsidy uh, desi was designed, uh, the way it was designed, it was designed to sustain people who have ability to have a very good credit line and are able to have a lot of money waiting for the government to reimburse every three months or so. Um, for instance, um, today this when uh, they had, uh, the, there was a payment from the government of about 16 billion towards the subsidy, and uh, uh, so they have sort of set about 16 billion out of about 60 billion. They are still owed 44 billion. Very few local companies can afford that kind of money. And remember, these companies that cannot afford this kind of money now had resorted into getting their product through the, the few multinationals that are able to do that. So what in essence ha happened is that they were kicked out of the market because in the pricing structure of EPRA, uh, there was a component that was negotiated so that um, the, 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 the wholesale price cap was removed. And when it was removed, most of the multinationals ended up squeezing the margins. And to an extent that they were selling at the depot at the wholesale price, the same price they are selling at the pump. Mm -hmm. So most of the local dealers could not manage to work. And these are the people we are, take, we are saying we are subsidizing. Remember the owner of that petrol station in the villages um, is the owner, is the father and mother of the people who, is, who are being subsidized. Is the brother and the sister of the same people who are being subsidized. It was a zero-sum game. So we are correcting the market, and we are very happy that the subsidy is gone. Because once the market is corrected, then everybody within the value chain is able to get something, and the businesses are about to thrive. Let me stay with you for a minute, uh, Chomba, there. And you're talking about the fact that um, because of the subsidy, whereby you would um, get your imports, sell it to the market, now make claims to the government, mm. you, because of the delay in the settling of the subsidies, yes. you are running into working capital challenges. Exactly. And that is why then uh, you're saying a number of you are being pushed out of the industry. Out of the market. Something you've touched on that way, I want to come to uh, Chachi Logo to hear. He, Chomba argues that the subsidy model we've had was not anchored on sustainability. And if you look at uh, the third review of the IMF program, there was a commitment of a sunset date of October 31st. Do you feel it was unsustainable? Yes, I fully agree that uh, subsidy was unsustainable. And if you look at even the framework of w where the fuel subsidy was anchored, uh, it was to be through the petroleum development levy uh, order, whereby for every five shillings and 40 cents, uh, a part of the money that is getting into that fund is now to stabilize the international uh, prices, wh wherever the prices will be as determined by EPRA. No one knew exactly where the price at which uh, the government will stabilize the, the oil prices was at. It was like a moving target. Each and every time you find that the land cost was different. So it was a bit hard even to wrap your head around where exactly the, the, the subsidy, the stabilization is actually being done at. So that's one thing. The other thing, if you look at it uh, from the fact that from an income side, uh, you are getting five shillings and 40 cents for every liter. And yet you are seeing subsidies for three products getting into 50 shillings a liter. Or it just tells you to, it was not sustainable. And, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, kerosene, which was not even part of the petroleum development levy, was even subsidized. So that to me, it was telling me that even the legal framework 
of which this subsidy program, or rather the stabilization program was anchored was, was quite weak, fragile. And it was just a matter of time that this kicking the can down the road will come to an end. And ultimately, here we are with it. Even in as much as even IMF through the, uh, this, the previous review was really categorical that there should be a sunset date to this uh, subsidy program. Professor Exxon Iraqi joining us from Mombasa. Do you agree that um, the subsidy, especially with regard to fuel, was indeed unsustainable right from the get-go? Uh, the problem uh, with the subsidy is that uh, is a, a political solution, is, a, is a, an economic solution. Uh, uh, let me put it this way. Subsidies are nothing but a political solution to an economic problem. So it could never be sustainable. At the end of the day, the question you should be asking is, when you give people subsidies, who pays for those subsidies? It is taxpayers. So in my opinion, subsidies are not the best solution to any economic problem. Let's use the market. Let's use supply and demand. So inevitably, I'm not surprised that they could not work. They have not worked anywhere else, and they will not work here. Right, thank you for those thoughts, uh, excellent Iraqi. But before we proceed further with this conversation, let's listen to what uh, President William Ruto said in his inaugural speech as far as the fuel subsidy is concerned. On fuel subsidy alone, the taxpayers have spent a whooping 144 billion, 60 billion in the last four months alone. If the subsidy continues to the end of the financial year, it will cost taxpayers 280 billion, equivalent to the entire national government development budget. Additionally, there was an attempt to subsidize UNGA in the run-up to the election, a program that cobbled up 7 billion in one month. In addition to being very costly, consumption subsidy interventions are prone to abuse. They distort markets and create uncertainty, including artificial shortages of the very products they seek to subsidize. And that was uh, President William Ruto in his inauguration speech speaking to the issue of the fuel subsidy and his argument as to why it's unsustainable. Before we take a break, let me take some comments here from uh, Chomba. So, but the issue is, um, did oil marketers have an agreement with the government as far as the window period for settling their subsidy arrears were concerned? And as we speak, how much is owed in arrears? Um, okay, in terms of argument, um, <coughs> the government has always argued that um, the process of verification of um, these uh, uh, subsidy invoices uh, that uh, are supposed to be reimbursed by the government is a laborious one that takes time. Um, and that's why they, they usually say sometimes it's, it's the reason for the delay. But that as it may be, we feel that um, because uh, the, the, the system that is used is a system that is known by everybody, it, there should be, have been systems put in place to make sure that these things are paid very fast. Um, as of yesterday, um, we, they were old upwards of 60 billion. And today, the government um, offset uh, 16 billion of the subsidy. So as we speak, the, um, OM, uh, the OMCs are old about, I think, 44, they are about billions. So a, a subsidy arrears of about 44 billion shillings yes. as we speak. Yes. That point by Mr. Martin Chomba takes us to a quick break. We shall be right back with a lot more on this conversation on subsidies and the cost of living. Welcome back to this conversation on Business Redefined. Subsidies and the cost of living is our topic of discussion tonight. We have uh, Martin Chomba from the Petroleum Dealers Association. Welcome back. We have Chachi Logutu, economist with IC Group, and Professor Exen Iraqi from the University of Nairobi, who's joining us from Mombasa. Professor, if I may start with you. The Kenya Kwanzaa administration has argued that uh, their business is not to subsidize consumption, it is to subsidize production, and that should yield some dividends as far as the cost of living coming down is concerned. But the critics have said, we do expect there will be a lag effect, because of course when you plant, it takes a while. Do you think that um, we could have some reprieve as far as the subsidizing fertilizer and the cost of living is concerned? I, I listened to the president making his speech, uh, and, it, and it was very clear he did not talk like a politician, he talked like an economist. Uh, and, and I think I agree with him that if you can subsidize production, it is much better than uh, subsidizing consumption. 
if people produce more maize, for example, at the end of the day, the supply of maize will go up and the price will automatically go down. So I, I think in the long run, we are going to have some relief for the prices. But in the short run, it might not be noticeable. And the question is, as a politician, how do you make your voters or your citizens believe that relief is coming in the future? You have to be very convincing. So I believe that relief is coming, but it will not, it not be immediate. But the, Professor, if I could stay with you, the counter-narrative to that has been that uh, fertilizer is not the only input when it comes to production in agriculture. There are a number of other variables in this equation, and as long as you're only dealing with them and not dealing with the rest, uh, how, what, what guarantee do we have that indeed this will have a supply-side cushion, as you put it? I think that's a question everybody has been asking. I've, I've, I've dubbed in farming some times ago, and I know that fertilizer is just one of the many factors. Look at the problem of rad fragmentation in Kenya. Small pieces of land that you cannot exploit economically and efficiently. You have to look at the regulation. If you look at one of the most vibrant sectors in Kenya, for example, for our industry, nobody talks about uh, flower board. It is a lot of free market that takes place. So fertilizer is one of the factors that make the price of food go up. But we have to consider all the other factors. You have to look at the whole supply chain. You have to look at the regulation. And you have to look at something as simple as our persistence that we must eat ugari. Why can't we eat chapat? Why can't we eat, eat other, other types of food? I remember C.S. Munya asking that question. And I totally agree with him. At the time we diversified away from ugari and eat other foods so that we stop putting too much pressure on the price of maize flour. Thank you so much for that, uh, Professor. And uh, just to stay with that point which is raising, let me come to Churchill. Churchill, we did uh, a story here at NTV doing a comparison in terms of the alternative, whether it is potatoes, arrow roots, cassava. And our inference was, or our conclusion was, that it is not just a preference question. It is actually an affordability question. Uh, part of the reason why Kenyans predominantly consume maize is actually because of affordability. If you look at the alternatives, they're not just as cost effective as sometimes we perceive them to be. Do you think then we might be missing the picture when we argue that uh, Kenyans need to diversify away from the staple? Uh, thanks, Julians. Uh, well, I also partly agree with the uh, Prof's remark uh, in terms of uh, even looking at the issues around uh, diversification. Uh, yeah, I issue around diversification, sorry about that. Uh, and, uh, and also to your point, uh, affordability. And uh, just to look at the whole issue around uh, just tying in with this whole fertilizer issue, uh, it speaks to the fact that if you look at the statistics for 2021, whereby fertilizers around 26% of the overall agricultural uh, manufacturing inputs, and whereby we have uh, a fuel and uh, well, also around 20% of input. So even in this whole conversation around uh, what are we subsi subs uh, subsidizing, are we subsidizing production or are we subsidizing consumption, I see that on balance we'll still end up with the same issue whereby probably the prices may not be as, even if you look at subs uh, substitution, uh, we may not even have a higher differential even in terms of even looking at the fertilizer because on one hand, fuel prices, we still expect it to go higher even with some of the price increases that we still expect. So affordability might be, might be in my view, this is my view, might be not something that might be pursued even going forward here. Yeah. So probably we may just see people looking at the crops that they are able to afford or, or they are able to um, more or less, uh, which is available to them, and that now boils down to maize, which is one of the staple food uh, in, in the Kenyan economy. Okay. Um, let me come to uh, Martin here, and uh, Jackson, if you could have that graphic on screen where we were breaking down the subsidy per product over the last, uh, between November and uh, September this year. If you do the breakdown there, you can see um, the subsidy which went into diesel was a staggering 69 billion shillings. Kerosene was at 31.9 billion shillings, and uh, we also have uh, super petrol at just about the same figure. And let me come to Martin. Um, one of the questions Kenyans are asking themselves right now is, um, given the sort of slash we saw in the subsidy in the latest review, when it comes to the next one due on October 14th, are we expecting to see that we shall see the subsidy on diesel done away with, potentially only kerosene because it 
largely targets the bottom of the economic pyramid being sustained. And I know you don't hold brief from the, for the government, yes. but as a market player, yes. what would be your expectation? Okay, and, and, it, and it's very important also to make, uh, to say that I represent the guys at the, 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 the lower card of the value chain, uh, but there's a way we see it. And um, as you have you rightly said, uh, we are likely to see a slashing, a, a, a complete doing away with um, the, the, the subsidy. Uh, one, the, the government has uh, indicated so. The other one is this, this pressure from IMF, which has given uh, October as a deadline for the subsidy. So what we are likely to see is that um, the price of diesel will go up astronomically as uh, the price of uh, kerosene. But uh, in the long run, this month, prices will go up. But if you look at this and study the, 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 the world market uh, of prices, the, the, the crude that we consume, the Muban crude that we consume in Kenya, the prices have started uh, plummeting. We have come from the highs of about uh, $120 per barrel to the current 80 something dollars per barrel. That price, we are, suppo we are likely to feel it in the, within the month of November. Uh, the pricing cycle of November, December, we are likely to feel that. So at the end of the day, um, they, they, they are likely, we are likely, it, like we say, it is darkest before dawn. Yeah. It's likely to be, we are likely to have a reprieve within that month. But for now, we are going to have it rough because uh, when diesel prices go up, uh, the production goes, uh, the prices go up because diesel is what is used in the industries. But as we are doing this, we are getting back a derailed train on track because every sector within the value chain of petroleum distribution in this country is getting back. Maybe what we may want to look at um, in future is uh, things like uh, the tax regime, uh, because as, uh, you are, you, we have started seeing, uh, people had started going away from uh, kerosene. It, yeah. it was supposed to be that which uh, fuels the common man. But uh, when we zero-rated the, the gas uh, um, uh, from uh, taxes, the, the, everybody was now starting to get traction in terms of using gas as a method of cooking. But all of a sudden, we have reintroduced the taxes and, and that on gas, and now people are reverting back to kerosene. Yeah. It is not unique here because we've ne even seen, uh, because of unique circumstances in Europe, people reverting to things like coal. But um, it is not sustainable in future, and it's not in tandem with even uh, the green economy that we are looking at. We were looking to win off the population of the, uh, the, the dependence on fossil fuel in terms of cooking. Yeah. So it, 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 it is dark, but it's just about done. Let me stay with you for a while, uh, Martin. And uh, when you talk about, we, we're seeing the global price of oil now easing out compared to what we have seen in the recent past. Yes. But the, critic that, uh, the criticism that Kenyans normally level against you and your fellow players okay. is that whereas you're very fast in scaling up the price when prices are going up, okay. when the prices are coming down, we don't see you being as eager in yeah. terms of uh, revising the prices downwards. How do you respond to that? L let me respond to that. Um, and thank you for bringing up that point because it's one of the um, ambiguities within the market. Uh, people have this um, idea that uh, the energy sector or petroleum distribution in this country is this thing that is, cannot be understood. We have a pricing structure in this country, and this pricing structure is um, adjudicated by EPRA. Yeah. And in most, it, it, it takes um, uh, effect, um, the usually price, an average of the vessels that come within a pricing cycle. This is 30 days pricing cycle. So they do an average, and from that average, they give the margins. Actually, what uh, the common person does not know is that when you hear that uh, the pricing uh, formula gives the, the, the marketing, the value chain, uh, 12 shillings, it is this money does not go to one person. The people who, it is, it's structured in three uh, categories. The first four shillings is given to the marketer, to the person who imported the product, uh, the four shillings. Then the other four shillings is given to the person who invested in building the petrol station. And then we have the dealer at the station level. Because unlike what people do not know, is that most of these branded stations you see, they don't belong to the, to, to the organization that it brands them. It's actually a franchise. So yeah. that dealer down there gets another four shillings. So these four shillings is uh, divided within the value chain. Yeah. And there are people who even get lost there because they are transporters and there are other people who do so many things within the value chain and they're not within the pricing uh, uh, structure. So at the end of the day, the reason why the prices are not very quick to uh, go down is because these people are considering that average. But whenever the prices are going up, you know as we are a capitalist system and people <laughs> want to make sure that they don't burn their fingers that the price goes up. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's mainly the reason. I'm, I'm not sure that's a fair position for Kenyans, <laughs> but anyway, let me come to <laughs> Professor X. Iraqi. Uh, Professor, we now have 
the cost of living in this country at the highest point, we've seen it in 63 months. The latest data from KNBS inflation is at 8.5%. Given the doing away of the subsidies, what are your expectations in terms of what we see, we are likely to see in the near term as far as inflation is concerned? It's obvious that if you remove the subsidies, the price of oil, the price of the basics will go up. So immediately I expect the inflation to go beyond that 8.5%. 8 but if what uh, the central bank and other predictors are saying is that things will get worse before they become better. So maybe the next five, six months, I expect the price of basic commodities to go up. Then when the price of uh, petroleum and other products start going down, then the price will go down. But my worry is exactly what we raised a few minutes ago, that prices are always very quick in going up, but very slow in going down. As uh, John Maynard Keynes said, uh, wages are sticky. So when prices are going down, they are very sticky. So I think we should prepare for some adjustment in prices upwards, but if you are patient, they will go down. As somebody put it, the price of petroleum is going down in the international market, and we expect that to be reflected uh, over here. But my concern is that uh, I have a feeling that the, the petroleum prices are overregulated in this country. When you talk of subsidies, why can't you also get subsidies by reducing the tax on petroleum products? If we are going to reduce the cost of petrol, diesel, and so on, the government can also forfeit some tax, which can also be seen as another of sub form of subsidy, and most of us are going to benefit from that. Right. Uh, Professor X in Iraqi, that point takes us to another quick break. We shall be coming back with a lot more, including now picking up from what uh, Professor has talked about. We had the Petroleum Taxes and Levies Amendment Bill of 2021. It never went beyond the first reading in the National Assembly. What exactly happened and what could that mean? That and more after the break. Welcome back to this conversation on Business Redefined. We are focusing on the subject of subsidies and the cost of living. Before the break, Professor X N Iraqi was telling us that uh, his view is that the petroleum sector in this country is overregulated, and he thinks that uh, maybe perhaps we should be able to do it with some taxes and levies and have uh, that consideration. We shall be coming back to that in a little bit, but let me stick, come to Churchill here. Churchill. Where do you expect inflation to settle? Are we now breaching the double digits given what we have seen in the pump price revision? Yeah, I think to an extent uh, we'll get into the double digits territory. But then again, let me look at it in this way. If you look at the component of the consumer price index basket, uh, the three fuel commodities, that's super petrol, diesel, and kerosene. Collectively, the last time I checked, following the rebasing of the CPI basket, I was looking at a 1.1%. 1.21% weighting in the aggregate CPA basket. So that to me has, has seen a stickiness in the inflationary print over the course of the last four to six months in Kenyan, in Kenyan uh, economy, as compared to other African peers, say Ghana, Nigeria, whose inflation has really shot up. Uh, Ghana is around 3%, Nigeria is around 20%, be primarily because of the uh, negative feedback uh, that has come through the fuel inflation on the economies. So that to me, from a methodological perspective, I'm still seeing that it could be sticky. But then again, there are second, second round effects uh, when we see diesel going up has an impact through the transport uh, chain and also the food transportation. So from that perspective, you could see even uh, food inflation going up, transport index going up, and that will lead to uh, the f uh, overall headline inflation getting into uh, double digits even in the near term. Okay. Chomba, do you agree with the professor that um, petroleum sector and particularly around pricing is overregulated? Yes, it's overregulated. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> just, just looking at uh, uh, things like as, as e simple as VAT today. Um, the government collects um, upwards of 60 shillings on super petrol in terms of taxes. And um, then you are told, today I'm told to sell super petrol at my station at 179 shillings. And I'm supposed to pay value added tax on that. The, 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 the government taxes are part and parcel of that. Yeah. Previously, we used to have um, a demarcation where we used to have, we would pay uh, for the, 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 what the vertible and non vertible mm -hmm. that, co that, that concept uh, disappeared, and now we pay for everything. So these you are paying tax on tax, 
If you look at that, that is a, a component of, of a regulation. If we had a, um, an ability as a country to do away with VAT on petroleum today, we would go back uh, maybe about 10 shillings or so on, on, on palm price. Yeah. Um, that is a component that can, they can look at. So uh, there are so many other components within the government, taxes, that builds up. Because if today we have a um, landing cost of uh, uh, petroleum, and, and, and that we are paying about we are paying taxes of about 60 shillings that tells you and we are selling we are supposed to sell at uh, one uh, 179 it means that those prices minus government taxes are about a hundred shilling yeah. so if the government was modest and took about the, uh, 30 shillings we would be doing about 130 so I am of the professor's view that we are over taxed and um, unfortunately, the way they want to, uh, whenever the government wants to do away with the high prices of petroleum, they run to the guys at the bottom of the pyramid. The guys were within the philosophy of bottom up. Because what, what happens is, the pricing structure and what brings a lot of cost in this is not how we are selling the product today. It's how we have, cost, we have structured the costs of bringing the product in this country. Yeah. If we are going to look even at the, the petroleum bill that we are talking about, we need to have a holistic look at the pricing structure all the way from the OTS. There are so many other things that we pay for, including things like demerage, which in essence we are paying for people's inefficiency. Yeah. Today we line up uh, uh, vessels in the, in, the, in the high seas, so there shouldn't be cost of demerage. And when you come and charge people cost of demerage, then you're telling me to pay for somebody's inefficiency at their place of work. So there, and, and there are so many other components, if you look at them, that can be taken out, out of the pricing structure with the OTS that would bring down the cost right. of the petroleum. Not going for the guy at the, uh, who is getting four shillings, who is not even able to sustain, because the last time we were supposed to add to 15 shillings, yeah. now they're talking about slashing. Let me hold you there and just say for the sake of our viewers, when uh, Chomba talks about OTS as an open tender system, which is yes. used to import petroleum products, when he talks about DEMA, register the charges you have when your vessel is docking at the port more longer than it should have, and therefore you start incurring charges for that. So let me come to uh, Professor Iraqi and uh, this argument around maybe we could do away with some of the taxes and the levies and be able to um, bring down this cost, but we are within the realities of an IMF program which has revenue targets as part of the conditions. Do you think this plan for levy, uh, doing away with taxes and levies is dead on arrival within that context? Ask the question again, please. So the, there has been the discussion that we could bring down the cost of uh, petroleum products by doing away with taxes and levies, but yet we are within the IMF program which has revenue targets, tax revenue targets, as part of the conditions. Do you think then it renders it not feasible? I think the question you should be asking is, does the government have an alternative source of revenue apart from those taxes? If you look at our budget every year, we always have a budget deficit. So the government will be the last uh, entity to try and reduce its revenues. So it's going to be interesting to see how the government is going to react under the, uh, under the urging of the IMF to, to increase, uh, to remove the subsidies. And one of the reasons why they want to reduce the subsidies is to make the market play its law. But at the end of the day, the government is interested in extra revenue. So I think the government will be very reluctant to reduce the taxes unless you give us an alternative source of revenue. One of the reasons why governments all over the world like taxing petroleum and uh, related products is because every economist will tell you that uh, people are addicted to cars, they are addicted to transport. So even if you increase the, the, the tax rate, people will still buy petroleum, they still go to work. So it's a very lucrative source of revenue. And I think the government, the time the government reduced its addiction to revenues from petroleum, let's look at alternatives. And I believe they are there. Digital economy, they try to do that. There's a lot of money in the digital economy. And there's a lot of money in other areas. So if we expanded our economy, we made our economy very vibrant by reducing the regulations, by making it easier to start business and expand them, there will be more taxpayers. We don't need to rely on one product like petroleum. And I believe that is possible. Uh, Churchill on the same uh, beat. Uh, Professor Day is saying we have a number of alternatives. Uh, the digital economy, we've seen the digital services tax coming in. He's talking about um, widening the tax net. We know the struggles that the government has had as far as that is concerned. What options do you see on the table where if we were to do away with some of the taxes and levies on the petroleum products? Yeah, I fully agree with what Prof. said. Uh, look at it, uh, the discussions around uh, the um, 
tax revenue mobilization strategy. That's a five-year plank in terms of ensuring that uh, the taxes are quite, uh, I mean, it's predictable. So one of the things that we could see the government pursuing, uh, I know it's due to public participation, is to ensure that, I mean, uh, that uh, domestic revenue mobilization strategy is followed through so that you don't have each and every year, fiscal year, that there are some new tax uh, proposals that even some of them touch to these uh, issues to do with petroleum taxes. And then an another issue which uh, was discussed earlier is even the avenue that some of the taxes are passed in parliament. Case in point is now the Petroleum Development Levy Order. That was a regulation. It was not through a usual bill of parliament. And that being the case, and what played out in 2020, it was now through the Committee of Delegated Legislation. So ideally, that Committee of Le Delegated legisl Legislation, what it does is just to look at whether uh, processes was followed before this particular piece of legislation was uh, gazetted by the relevant Minister of Energy. So even the discussions when we had the petroleum uh, um, amendment bill uh, last year was that rather than having the levies now coming through uh, legislation, they should come through as a bill of parliament to ensure that there's a wider consultation rather than the other route of through legislation. So I think uh, even going forward, even in terms of legislation, we could see some coherent bills Obviously, the last one that we saw was dead on arrival for some reason which has never been uh, communicated to us. But going forward, we need to see relevant uh, pieces of legislat legislation, at least to ensure that even there's a wider participation uh, by the public whenever these petroleum bills proposals come to, to the fore. Okay. Uh, Martin, let me come to you. And one question which uh, a number of people are asking online is, um, how many petrol stations have been closed? as a result of uh, the hiccups we have had in terms of um, subsidies delaying and therefore people running into working capital challenges. Okay, Pe uh, our Petroleum Outlets Association uh, of Kenya, the organization I head, uh, is an amalgamation of petroleum uh, outlets across the country. And uh, <coughs> an empirical study that was uh, commissioned by EPRA uh, has um, f uh, gone ahead and uh, reported that 68% of the pump outlay in this country of over 4,000 200 uh, petrol stations, 68% uh, of that belongs to the independent. This independent uh, market is the one that uh, had to close because of the pricing component I told you, the, pr the wholesale uh, pricing cap that was removed as a negotiation between the Mot Nationals and the, the EPRA and the Ministry of Petroleum so, uh, because of the subsidy. So when that was done, uh, we were literally thrown under the bus. We did not have margins, we could not uh, buy, we would used to buy at the, beyond the price that uh, is uh, at the pump. So uh, in that is effect, people who do not have enough capital to sustain operations waiting for um, a good day to come by had to close. And empirically we've proven over 1,200 petrol stations that belongs to independent petroleum dealers. And these are the people, when I speak about independent, I'm talking about the people who feed the rural areas. These are the f guys who drive the, who, f who, who drives the, the mode of propulsion within the villages, the probox and uh, the, 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 the border borders and the centers of this world. And these are the same people during the fuel crisis of March and April, yeah. who when they did not have product, use, made the whole uh, country um, uninhabitable in terms of uh, petroleum uh, distribution speaking. And until when our organization was given two, 26 metric tons of uh, petro petroleum, yeah. we were able to ease the crisis that we had. So where we are headed again is that these big multinationals, they don't reach the villages out there. And those villages are served by us. And when we are not able to operate, so the, the, the economies within the villages have died because most of these guys will uh, get back yeah. to the, the stations uh, which are centered around them, the business centers. And these will, in fact, even slow down the uh, evolution of devolution as, me, as, as it may. So uh, most of our, our people have closed their stations because there's a lot of um, elit elitism in terms of uh, uh, making uh, laws and policies that governs distribution of petroleum in this country. It does not take account of that person who accounts for 45% of throughput of the petroleum that goes uh, out into this country um, to, the, to the consumers. Okay. Yeah. And that point by uh, Martin Chomba takes us to another break. We shall be back with the tail end of this conversation on subsidies and the cost of living. Stay tuned.
session on Business Redefined, where we are focusing on subsidies and the cost of living. We have uh, Professor Axel Iraqi from the University of Nairobi, Chachi Logutu joining us from IC Group, and Martin Chomba, who is the chairperson of the Petroleum Outlets Association. Gentlemen, welcome back on set. Uh, Professor, let me start with you. And uh, one of the questions um, Kenyans are asking largely based on the sentiments you made around subsidizing consumption versus subsidizing production. When we look at what was announced today about the fertilizer subsidy, 3.5 billion shillings set aside by Treasury, someone is asking, why not just issue cash transfers to Kenyans and uh, address some of the challenges they're having in the immediate sense? That, that's a very important observation. If you look at some uh, some organizations like World Food Program and other relief organizations, that's actually the approach they have used. And you you talked about it earlier that we are assuming that the most imp the most pressing problem for the farmers is fertilizer. So if you give them cash cash transfers, they would probably make a better decision on where to put that money. So I totally agree with you that uh, to, to the to the to the viewers that I would probably go for cash transfers. And I want to give you a good example that is more life. When you go for a wedding of, a, of your friends and so on, it's always good if you can give them money so that they decide what to do with that money. If you don't do that, you bring a croc, another person brings a croc, another person brings this. So you find yourself with the 10 crocs in the house. You don't know what to do with them. <laughs> so it's always good to give farmers a choice. Give them the money. They decide whether the fertilizer is the problem, whether it is uh, the fuel, whether it is the storage for their silage. Let them decide. I totally agree with you. Choices are very important in economics. Thank you so much for that, uh, Professor X. And, and let me, the same question really to Churchill. Um, Professor is telling us, I mean, optionality is very important when it comes to what you want to do with the resources you have. 3.6 billion shillings, why not issue cash transfers? Yeah, that's a um, great question you forced to me. And let me just put it in the context of Egypt. Uh, Egypt has a food subsidy system, a system in the sense that it has three main components. So the first one is uh, food ration cards, which is given to like 64 million of its population. Uh, the second chunk of that is now the bread subsidy program, which uh, for every person within that program, they are given like five loaves per day uh, as part of the subsidy system. And then the last one is now the flour subsidy uh, system, whereby for the warehouses or the producers of wheat, uh, they are now, at least the flour is subsidized. So at least in that context, that whole complete system, there are three more or less legs in terms of how uh, Egypt is subsidizing their, 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 their wheat. You know what happened when the Russia-Ukraine fallout came about? Wheat, uh, Egypt is a main uh, wheat importer and it had negative spillover effect as a result of the war. So from that perspective, at least in a, if uh, the food bread subsidy program, which used to cost $3 billion a year, and it was expected now to, to double to around $6 billion a year, at least if that's expensive, so you can now maneuver and get it to the food rational program. Uh, so increase from 64 million people to around 70 million who are relying on the bread subsidy program. So I think uh, with options, uh, it now, it's, it, it makes it even uh, possible even for the the, the end user at least to maneuver on some of the ways they can now be able to uh, absorb or cushion themselves uh, with, with the adverse uh, effects of uh, the higher food prices. All right. Um, let me come to Chomba. The Petroleum Taxes and Levies Amendment Bill proposed to slash VAT on petroleum products from uh, the present situation by nearly half and also cap supplier margins from a ceiling of 12 shillings to 9 shillings. What are your thoughts on the supplier margin? Actually, um, my thoughts on the supplier margin is that um, <coughs> it is goes against any, any sensible way of looking at business. And uh, I'm so the reason why I'm saying this is that uh, the, the supplier, the, 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 the dealer's margin has always become the, where the, the people run to in, when they want to look at uh, reducing the cost of um, the, the, the petroleum product. But what people don't uh, take into consideration is the margins that we are getting today, four shillings per litre, is what we were getting 12, 12 years ago. And the cost of living has gone up. So when we are talking about raising the standards of the cost of living, uh, and raising everywhere, we are talking about reducing the margins of and who, the person who bears all the operation costs. Let me give you a very good example, Julian. When most nationals and, um, do importation of petroleum, 
a lot of costs is taken care of by the system. Things like losses are taken care of. Uh, the, 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 there are a whole lot of things that the, the, the system takes care of. But when you come to the guys who is at the, at the end retail, nobody takes care of their losses. Nobody takes care of uh, how they, uh, they sell their product, but we are very quick to look at it. When we are lo the, actually, the way we should look at this, and as I started by saying, is that somebody somewhere is very lazy because they don't want to look at the whole pricing structure all the way from the OTS. You are coming to take away from the guys who is the dealer, yet the place where you can re re restructure the, uh, the, and get some value in terms of uh, pr uh, reducing the, pr the cost of our uh, pump is by restructuring the way we cost our, our things, including the, the OTS structure. If we are able to do that, if you are able to look at wholesome uh, pricing structure from the OTS to the, de to the dealer, uh, the, we are able to say, look guys, this is where we are losing value. And from that point, we are, very, we are able to reduce objectively the, the pump price. But if we always run to the dealer, then we are losing the plot. And I can assure you, uh, Julian, and I can assure Kenyans here today, that if it is true that this goes on and the, 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 prices, uh, the prices of the dealers are slashed from uh, the, 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 the 12 shillings that are there in the structure to 9 shillings, we are going to have more than half of the people dealing today closing their operations okay. because even as they are today they are struggling most of them are closing i tell people if you thought the petroleum industry is very lucrative people like mobile exxon would not have left this market yeah. people like ajip would not have left this market they left because it was not sustainable so we must be very careful and avoid laziness within the pricing uh, formula to make sure that we are able to restructure the whole thing not to run to kill the guy at the bottom but we have a minute to take a break, but very quickly now, a counter-narrative to what you would say is that, uh, look, uh, mm -hmm. margins are a function of your revenues and your costs. Why mm -hmm. can't you work on streamlining your costs, especially when you talk about many fragmented independent players? Why can't you balkanize and come together and be able to trim some of your, your costs and be able to now optimize on your margins? Thank you for that question. Um, what people don't realize about this market, the people we represent today are not people who sat down with a business plan to make to, to sell petroleum. These are the people who sell petroleum as a matter of survival. I want you to look at them as the way you look at the guy who decides to start baking some, some, some cake, mandazi in Kibera, that where some of us started. And they are not there by design. They are there by default. This is what they do. It's just like that mama who started selling mboga. And this is even the issues that we are having in we even with the taxman because they don't understand us. Today, they are, tell, they are putting us on with the holding tax, whereas the people we buy from multinationals are not uh, are exempted from withholding. We don't have somewhere to get this product from because those guys tell you don't withhold from me, yet the taxman tells you you are a withholding agent. So what we are trying to say is that people do not understand the lower cadre of the business of the petroleum distribution, and these people do not have a business plan. They don't understand these things. We are trying to bring them to the, the fore, and the government and every other stakeholder must hold our hands to appreciate the fact, including the taxman, that we are trying to bring a whole number of people into the tax bracket, people who would otherwise not be there. And that's why we are saying, whatever happens, this bottom up is the best approach <laughs> that is there into this market today. Let me just clarify that this show does not hold brief for the Kenya Kwanzaa Actually, that's not a political <laughs> statement. <laughs> it's not a political statement. We'll I take a quick break. That. We shall be right back yeah. now to close this conversation. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome to the tail end of this conversation. We are delighted to be talking about matters of subsidies and cost of living, and we are now closing up this conversation. Let me start with uh, Professor X and Iraqi. Um, the question being asked online by Kenyans is, how can a government be promising us um, relief in the medium term while even we can't survive the short term? That's a good question because as individuals, you and me, we live in the short term, but the government often lives in the long run, making long-term plans. So there's always a conflict between our belief, what we, what we expect, what we want to do, and what the government expects. So that's not surprising. 
and we should do, we should uh, accept that reality that our plans and government plans do not always coincide. That's why somebody promised that uh, when we go to the polls, the prices are going to go down. But they didn't tell us that the prices are going to go down in the long run, not in the short run. Because some of the forces that are making Kenyans suffer are out of the control of the government. We have no control over how long Russia and Ukraine are going to fight and restrict the supply of oil and gas. We have no control over when it is going to rain or not rain. So we must be cognizant of that fact that some of the factors that are making the prices go up are not within the government control. They are not even within individual control. But it is always easier to, to, to blame the government because we can see it. And very important, we voted for it. But maybe before I finish, I need to make a few comments which I think are important in terms of uh, reducing the cost of living. We are, for example, forgetting that uh, at the end of the day, there are some simple things we can do and reduce the cost of living, particularly the price of petroleum. How comes we cannot change the tethering system? Why must one person, one entity import petroleum? Why don't we let anybody who can import petroleum import? So there will be a lot of petroleum being imported, the supply will go up and the prices will go down. The competition resulting from that will, will mean that people become more innovative in terms of logistics, in terms of managing the supply chain, in terms of storage and so on. And number two, you'll be surprised that if the government reduced the tax rate on petroleum, they would actually collect more taxes because we are going to travel more. We are going to use more petroleum. And if you look at the volume, the government might end up collecting more taxes than when we focus on the unit. So if, if we've, we've started thinking outside the box, we can solve all these problems. And, one, and the last question or the last comment is, why are we talking so much about imported oil when we have oil here? Why can't we exploit it? Why are we not talking about how to price the oil that is got from Trokana or other parts of this country? Why must we always talk about imported oil when we have oil in this country? What are we waiting for? Thank you for that, uh, Professor X and Iraqi. On the issue of Turkana oil, we had a series here we ran on in terms of the headwinds that Kenya ran into as far as exploration of oil is concerned. I wish we had time for that conversation, but it's one for another day. Let me come to Churchill on the same question. Um, we were told that in the long run we are all dead, and therefore Kenyans want solutions now. Yeah, uh, thanks. And ultimately, within the whole discourse around subsidy, uh, there's a fiscal cost element to, to it. Uh, numbers have been thrown all over the place. Uh, from the official numbers, we are hearing that over the course of last financial aid, it was around 80 billion that went into subsidies, but primarily that's on the fuel subsidy. We've had numbers going as far as 140 billion. So there's a fiscal cost to the subsidy uh, issue that we are seeing, but right now, uh, it's a gradual adjustment. We started seeing even with the la latest uh, EPRA review, uh, that was on the super petrol, so it will gradually get into the other fuel commodities. So it will be, uh, it's th th the shift is, it was expected that ultimately uh, this subsidy was not sustainable and even what you've had uh, throughout the, the, the show. Uh, in terms of even the market players, uh, even in terms of the subsidy, they have not even received that amount of money. So there's a fiscal cost to that, but right now, at least the lesser evil is still painful uh, in the short term. But uh, as we all know, that some of the factors that have led to the upward uh, increase in the fuel pump prices is outside our control. But eventually, as we say, in as much as in the long run we are all dead, uh, in this whole issue on around some of the external factors, I don't think it will be remain forever. At some point, some of these uh, headwinds will, see, will ease and cease, and then we could see some normalcy in the fuel pump prices. So in the near term, we'll get some, uh, some, some pain uh, with the gradual adjustment in the fuel pump prices, but ultimately, we'll still, uh, some of these factors will, will web away. But also, uh, s state factors, they need to come uh, quite uh, handy in terms of uh, policy measures. Uh, we saw last year the tax bill amendment uh, which uh, didn't go past the first reading stage. So probably the third, uh, the th 13th parliament needs to be quite uh, instrumental in terms of uh, coming up with the policies to ensure that even uh, the fuel pump prices, uh, be it the concerns that have been raised here from the OTA system, that whole pricing mechanism needs to be brought back to more sustainable level. Okay. Martin Chomba, let me come to you. Looking at the comments online, 
oil market retailers, you don't have a lot of goodwill from Kenyans. Kenyans are actually skeptical that even as you said the global price is coming down, yeah. you won't extend the same relief to Kenyans. The, 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 the reason why <coughs> the Kenyans don't have a lot of goodwill in, uh, in, in, in market uh, distributors across the country is because they are not, there has not been information enough to let people understand that there is a difference between the oil marketer and an oil uh, petroleum dealer. The person who is a dealer, like uh, say for instance Martin Chomba, Martin Chomba buys uh, 2,000 liters of, of, of petrol from the depot from uh, Amot National and goes to sell at their place. And this product is, is what you sell daily. You turn that on daily. So it is not the dealer who does not reduce the price of petrol. It is where we buy from that we know does not reduce the price of petrol. And remember again, the, the distribution price um, system of this country is capped. It is a command by EPRA, by, which is a government agency. So the reduction of that petrol, as people are saying that we are not very quick to reduce, is not uh, dependent on us as, as, as players. It is dependent on, on the government uh, through EPRA. And as such, we don't have a leverage whether to to, we can reduce, but the government is the one that leads, gives the lead on, on in terms of the pricing every 14th of every month because that is statutory uh, anchored in law and, and there's nothing that uh, the dealer at the down, uh, and the downstream can do about it. And that's why even if the prices today of the petroleum uh, commodities went up today, we cannot raise the price up until 14th. Okay. So it, it is not fair for Kenyans to judge us that way. We are controlled by EPRA. Okay. We don't have a lot of leverage when it comes to that. So we have about five minutes to go. Let me get to the closing remarks. And let me start with uh, Professor Iraqi. Professor, your closing thoughts. And as you answer that, one of the realities Kenyans have to deal with in about a week or so is the inflation adjustment of excise tax, with which Kerry issued a notice about two weeks ago. Uh, therefore, we are expecting prices to go further up. Your closing thoughts and what do you think about um, inflation adjustment of excise? I think that's that's the wrong time to get uh, to put more to put, to put more taxes on Kenyan on Kenyans. Probably should have, should not have come at that time. But I, I I think in my in my opinion, if you look at the discussion we have been having the last one hour or so, it is very clear that this industry is overregulated. I don't know which other industry people sit and start negotiating about prices. <laughs> we should liberalise this market completely, and I'm very sure the prices will adjust downwards. If you look back to about uh, 30 years ago, around 1990, when we started liberalizing our economy, the prices went up, but they, st they eventually stabilized. I remember as a young boy being sent by my mom to go and buy sugar, and I was told by the shopkeeper that before you buy sugar, you must buy tea leaves, you must buy something else because the prices were controlled. But when the economy was liberalized, the prices stabilized. So I don't know why we cannot do that. And we have a very good e example about that period. So just because the prices are going up should not dissuade us from uh, uh, setting the economy free. Let's set the prices free because we have found the subways are not working. Nobody is uh, better than the market. Let the market do its work. But if it doesn't work, do its work, we can always come up with a good regulation. That has been a practice elsewhere. We are not an exception. Thank you for that, uh, Professor, uh, issuing, bring us to the conversation of liberalizing the markets. Chachil, your closing thoughts? Uh, well, uh, on the issue around uh, inflation adjustment, I think it boils down to the more or less dual system of excise duty rates, whereby we have on one hand specific, specific rates and then we have the percentage rates. So, and to be honest, if you look at the average rate uh, over the previous financial year, uh, which you can now work at 6.3%, that was the average over the last financial year, and then you look at the specific commodities that are expected to be taxed on that, you find that even the price increment over the last financial year has not adjusted as much. So it's a bit of a disadvantage. It's, it's a disadvantage yes, to some of the products that are expected to adjust via inflation, yet the commodities did not adjust. So I think uh, they need to have a, uh, probably an overhaul around this inflation adjustment if it just now gets back to uh, some percentages. So mm -hmm. as to ensure that there's some predictability in terms of uh, the, the, the commodities that are subject to inflation uh, rate of adjustment. Uh, that said, uh, closing remark, I think uh, it was about time that uh, we see an end to uh, the subsidy program. Uh, it had a major fiscal cost uh, which it wasn't uh, on the long end, it wasn't quite uh, prudent to our fiscal. So it's painful right now, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's an easier way to get out of this uh, subsidy uh, treadmill.
Thanks. Martin Chomba, your closing thoughts. Oh, my closing thoughts is that um, um, I, I would want to urge the government and the, the stakeholders within the value chain of the petroleum petro uh, distribution in this country, and I want to tell them categorically that for this in industry to survive and to deliver value to the people of Kenya, we must take care of the person at the bottom. That person, if they are taken care of, they are going to bring value up, up the stream. And um, this will be achieved by avoiding what I called for a bit, uh, lack of a better word, elitism way of uh, making policies in this country. This will be avoided by getting representatives from people who understand what is happening down there. There are a whole lot of them, from the transporters, from the, 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 the dealers, and um, the whole uh, spectrum. Uh, the Ministry of Energy, EPRA, and um, even the, the taxman must do a deliberate and conscious effort to include the people uh, they are, they are in, in terms of thoughts and um, the way the business processes are the down cutter because you cannot marry the informal business with formal business. You have to understand there's a place. Somebody told me the other day that their ignorance uh, to what is happening is no defense. But I also told them that the government ignoring that it has an, an informal population is a bigger evil than yeah. the ignorance of that population. So my closing remark is whatever you do, make sure that the person at the bottom of the pyramid survives. And if they survive, we all survive. Thank you so much for your thoughts, gentlemen. Professor Axel Iraqi from the University of Nairobi, uh, Chachilo Guto from IC Group, and Martin Chomba from the Petroleum Outlets Association. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your feedback online. It's been overwhelming, and I wish you could capture all of it, but uh, we shall carry on with this conversation online and be able to bring your thoughts to visibility. Stay tuned to NTV.